investigation. And oh, wow, look at that. There were more non-disclosure agreements and more payments uh, given to other women, totaling over $12 million. Stephanie, Vince McMahon's daughter, left the company right, right before the allegations came out. But eventually, it was either, hey, Vince, step down or you're going to be fired. Uh, so Vince McMahon stepped down as, ch as chairman and CEO of WWE. And the company made Stephanie the co-CEO of WWE because a woman can't be CEO. We all know that. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> nice. It, so Stephanie was made the co-CEO of the company along with Nick Khan, not to be confused with Tony Khan, who is the CEO of AEW. So since Vince McMahon left, so, so Stephanie's is, husband... So is Shane just kind of like the Eric Trump? Yeah. Okay. Basically, well, yeah. Like yeah. Because so, I notice his name is not coming up in this conversation. No, it is not. It is all. not. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way that I see it, Stephanie McMahon and uh, Shane, Shane O'Mac have a relationship that's akin to Mike and Joel in Mystery Science Theater. Yeah. We're on completely opposite sides. You'll never see us together. We don't talk to each other. We'll never be seen at functions. I'm doing my own thing over here. You're doing your own thing over here. Hey, we don't hate each other. I don't know where those rumors came came about. Yeah. We don't hate each other. We'll just never be seen. He, he, he's 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 gone. He, okay, it's okay. surprising. He's just stepped away. Okay, so it's more akin to me. Yeah. So since Vince left, Stephanie's husband Triple H took over the creative side of the company, and wow. Who would have thought that not having a far-right racist billionaire asshat in charge of creative would be a good thing for the company? Morale is up, stock prices are up, live attendance is up. Uh, there are actual plot lines that make sense. Yeah. There's actual storytelling that isn't coming from a far-right racist billionaire asshat. Um, and things are looking really good for the WWE. So of course. Here comes Vince McMahon to fuck it all up. On December 13th of this month, the Wall Street Journal released a follow-up article on Vince, the same day that Vice released a feature film-length documentary called The Nine Lives of Vince McMahon. And from this comes news of two different women who are currently suing Vince McMahon for sexual assault. He is currently uh, being sued twice by two separate women who claimed that on two different occasions, Vince McMahon sexually assaulted him. So how is old Vinnie Mac taking the news? He, not only does he deny the allegations, not only does he refuse to give out payments to these two women, but of course, he's planning a comeback. Okay. Because everyone knows that professional wrestlers can't just retire. No. So according to his friends, and that's a big news thing there, Vince McMahon has friends. According to his friends, Vince thinks that he never should have stepped down, that the news against him would have blown over eventually, and he is hoping to return to the company soon. That's some big Trump energy right there, isn't yes. it? That's some Trump energy. A 77-year-old man with numerous sexual assault allegations wants to take his company back. And I just, As, and I'm sorry, I want to take a second since you brought it up to just say thank you. Thank you for finally doing your trading cards. I, I get a little Such, such beauty in absurdity. The great thing about it what is that what horrible is horrible disillusion. 
the best thing is that he's just selling NFTs, but he also knows that his supporters, his base, are old as freaking dirt. So he's calling them digital trading cards because there's no way that like 89 year old that the 89 Trump year old supporter in Alabama will know what the hell an NFT is. So it's Donald Trump digital trading cards. Donald Trump is literally becoming a parody of Donald Trump. So like if I made fun of Donald Trump, what Donald Trump is doing now is basically that like for his announcement about his NFTs, he literally hello it's your favorite president, Donald Trump. Baby. You love me. You, I'm your favorite president. Better than Lincoln. Better than Washington, I hope. And it's like, oh my God, you are a parody of oh, yourself no. at this point. Oh, go, go back and watch the commercial again. Yes, Jeez. he's saying all that. But it is so... Just, just dripping with self-doubt throughout the whole... Thing. It he has fucking beautiful. It's obvious he has no idea what an NFT is, what he's selling. He's like, it's you, funny you, because he's you could win dinner with me. Okay, maybe that's not such a prize. Yeah, he has. Uh, yeah, no, he's like, obviously he's never read the script before. Obviously, it's pretty freaking hilarious. So after news of Vince McMahon's hopeful comeback broke. WWE stock prices fell by 2%. And the scuttlebutt on the interwebs is that no one in the WWE wants Vince McMahon back. And oh! Oh, this has been a great year for people who hate Vince McMahon. It really has. I love this story. Vince McMahon is an asshole and wrestling is better without him. So. This is just my story of the year. Uh, meanwhile, in political news, the media is just tripping over each other to once again report for the 300th time, oh, it looks like this is the final nail in Donald Trump's coffin. His political future is no doubt over. You've said that 299 times before this point. I need you to shut your mouth. Saying it since fucking 2016. Everything was going to get Donald Trump. Everything. Hey, nice outfit. You you should have. It, Eleanor and I had a green party where we got a bunch of green dolls and we ate a bunch of green candy and green food, and we summoned Bloody Mary. Everyone knows Bloody Mary's green, and so you coming in with this outfit is just oh man. I wish I had that for the green party that we threw a uh, night or two ago. Uh he literally announced his first run for president by coming down a gold escalator and saying, I'm running for president of these United States. Also, fuck Mexicans. They're all rapists. And the news just said, oh, my goodness. He's never going to be president. Yeah. And they just kept saying that over and over again, numerous times a week. And just the fact that they're saying it right now, I need you to shut your mouth. Yeah. You know? I need you all to shut your mouth. Yeah, now that he's not going to be president for the second fucking time. Yeah. This year Which was I such a... I cannot understand how that can... Kill. We really have... Laws are just for us. Laws yep. are not for them yep. at all. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, trust me, I've been thinking about that all year. <laughs> the things that Donald Trump got away with, it's freaking astounding uh -huh. it is literally astounding all of them yeah all of it's them. ridiculous I mean it's, I mean it's not just trump is the biggest clown in the car you yeah. know yeah but it's not like he's the only one and it's yeah Nancy Pelosi stepping down almost made it too. you know yeah. like oh my god she was such a great politician no bitch who served decades in this government? Decades. Yeah. You, Joe Biden, a whole fucking lot of them. Okay? And we are on the brink of our country collapsing into a fascist state and mm -hmm. the extinction of the human species. Maybe your leadership wasn't that fucking good. 
Yeah. You know, what yeah. do you think? I mean, you were a great leader and, and this is where you brought us? One of my one of my favorite pastimes is scrolling through Twitter, finding a airtight fact check about something in politics, and then heading over to Facebook land of 80 year olds and finding people who think that the fake thing is true and then hitting them with a brutal fact check and just waiting for people to attack me. It's one of my favorite pastimes. I do it all the time. Yeah. And uh, one thing that's upsetting me right now is that so many people on the facey books has been attacking joe biden how dare you how dare you get uh wnba player Brittany grimer out of a russian prison and let this former marine stay in there how dare you and it's like okay but he went into a russian jail in 2018 do you yeah. know who was president then yeah. in 2018 and 2019? So shut your mouth now you care that he hasn't yeah. been let go. Yeah. Like you need First to shut time it. I'm hearing about this fucking guy. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Okay. I've got an, I've got, but, I've but, got a bit but of news. On the other, on the other side, I am, I am not going to jump up and down and, lick Joe Biden's sphincter because, god damn it, this is simply what I expect of you. Yeah. This is the bare fucking minimum. If one of our citizens are in a Russian jail, you get them the fuck out. That's the goddamn yeah. job. Yeah. It's also so upsetting to me I'm not going to bend that, over like... backwards and paint paintings of Joe Biden with fucking halos <laughs> over his head. Yeah. We're doing the baseline. Yeah, the, minute the bare minimum. The bare minimum. Okay, so this next this next bit of news is serious. I need to get my serious face on. Okay. I'm going to be bringing the podcast down a little bit, okay, Bunny? We are going to get very it. serious. All right, hold on, hold okay. on. Ten minute oh, warning. Me We're getting... Okay. We're gonna get, I've got two serious bits of news. Very serious. Okay? All right. You ready? Okay. I think so. In recent extremely sad news, this is the saddest news that you will hear all year 2022. This is the saddest bit of news. I'm being very serious. I know you think I'm doing a bit. I'm not doing a bit. There, this isn't funny. In extremely sad news, a West Virginia man was recently arrested and charged with six counts of animal abuse. He was caught shooting six puppies in the head and throwing their carcasses over a cliff. Of course, this story isn't funny. I did laugh pretty hard when I read it, but l hear me out, okay, Bunny? What I was thinking was, when I laughed at this news story, what I was thinking was, how do you explain this in a way that makes you innocent? Because no matter what someone, like, what is this guy's story? So I automatically thought of this West Virginia man like, well... <laughs> I live in West Virginia, so of course I was taking my gun out for a walk when suddenly there was a rustle in the bushes. Suddenly I'm surrounded by 40 rabid puppies yes. with knives. I managed to fight six of them off, and that caused the others to be. It, it, so I was trying to think of like, but then I started thinking of the logistics of the six dead puppies, Bunny. How would you go about it? Say you have to kill six puppies. How would you go about it? Would you put them all in a pen? Are they running Are they running around? Do you have them in a box? Do you have them in a bag, a burlap sack? Well, well, he threw over the cliff. After shooting them. Yeah, I, I the the shooting seems a little pointless. I think throwing them over the 
could have done it. That's a good point. He could have turned it into a game like, uh, what is it, when the disc clear and the oh, disc flies oh, yeah. into the air and then you shoot that. You could have made it like a game, like a target game. But like, here's like, the thing. Like, so, I, I would have to, uh, if for some reason I was in a position where I was forced to Maxwell, kill. you are laughing at puppies dying and it is very offensive. It is not cool because there's nothing funny about this. Someone throwing puppies in the air. Clear. I would. Oh, I would. I would, ha- I would have to go for stop throwing them off. The- I would have to like detach and minimize what is going on as much as you. Oh. And then it's like, do you do it one each, or do you gr- do you think you could? Managed to throw all six of them at the same time. You can tie their tails together, make them into a rat king. Yeah. Here's the thing. I was thinking of Deadpool, too. Do you think you could get all six with one bullet? They are small. Yeah. I was just thinking of the logistics of, let's say you've only got two bullets. I I would think that, like, it's pro- it's pretty improbable that you could kill, you could shoot six puppies in the head with one bullet. But... There is a better chance if you do three and three, one bullet for three and the other bullet for three. That one, I think, is more doable. But then I decided to read the entirety of the article, Bunny, and, and hear, hear this. Um, the man was found out about his crimes when hikers nearby heard whimpers and went to the sounds and found that... Um, the puppies were alive and bleeding to death from the head. One was already dead. One died on the way to the hospital, and the remaining four survived but were in so much pain that they were euthanized due to their serious injuries. He not only he only killed one immediately. How do you not automatically kill a puppy with a gunshot to the head? Wow, 40-year-old Jeremy Smallwood of West Virginia, not only did you do a horrific crime, how were you bad at it? Uh, Like, completely incompetent, yeah. That's like, I've got this puppy. I'm going to shoot it in the head. I wounded it. Let me try it again. All right. It's starting to be injured. Oh, look at this. I've got this gerbil. I mean, this I'm is gonna, a position. I'm going to tase it. Okay, it's starting to get hurt. This how is do a you... position I never want to find myself in, but I do believe if I ever find myself in that position, well, you have I to would kill be six successful puppies. at killing six puppies. How do you shoot? Six puppies in the head? I don't see myself failing at that. You shoot six puppies in the head. You throw the six puppies off of a cliff, and five of them are alive enough to call for help. You are so bad at shooting puppies in the head. Yeah. What the heck, 40-year-old Jeremy Smallwood of West Virginia? And is it really better a at cliff, puppies. or are you exaggerating? Like I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe it was maybe a you precipice threw them off the curb. I don't know. I don't know. I was I've been thinking about that. I want to go to the scene and uh, you know do like a crime scene recreation. Huh. Figure out exactly what happened. Also, uh, we've got two minutes and forty five seconds until Zoom restarts everything. Can you not press your fake cash register near the podcast? That sound is just triggering to me. I know I'm springing this on you, Bunny. Um, And I apologize, but with a small amount of time left, I just want to make this announcement about the future of this podcast. Okay. Uh. I, I've been through a lot in 2022. It's been a year of pain and it's been a year of growth. I've done a lot of changing and, it, you know, there's a new year coming up and I need to focus on myself. 
I need to focus on who I am and who I am becoming, who I am going to be. And so it's difficult to say this because we have this film podcast and people come to it for entertainment and for movie reviews. And, and it's an important part of me for me to go out and see new movies and, and to review films and to talk about it here. It's very important to me. So it's difficult for me to say this, but um, I will not be watching the new fucking avatar movie <laughs> at all. I won't be watching it. You can't make me watch it. I know it's the big new movie. Fuck you. I'm not seeing Avatar. I'm, okay, I'm I, not. I thought you were you were trying to time it, but that's what I thought you were. Oh, that would have been funny. Yeah, that would have been even better. But and no, I I'm not, just want to say. There it goes. Yeah. Uh. So. That's been our monologue. We are going to take a short break because we do this on Zoom and now we have less than a minute. <coughs> when we come back, it's going to be time for historic approximations or as we call it, hop! Close your mouth when you have that food in there. Because that was gross, dude. That was gross. You know that cartoon larva with the with the bugs? It looks like you, you, you're eating the characters. We are going to be talking about the history of hip hop and how it is somehow tied to Charles Rocket from the worst season of Saturday Night Live. Okay. How the birth of hip hop is somehow tied in a uh, six degrees of Kevin Bacon way to Charles Rocket, the uh, saddest, the uh, most hilarious crash and burn story in the history of Saturday Night Live. So we'll be. I think social security should be uh, privatized. You can't go to a supermarket without being accosted by a homeless guy. Democrats and liberals attack viciously. I will take over store time. Not if I have anything to say about it, Skeletor. We will fight to the death. Or, gentlemen, may I suggest a second option? What if we all enjoy the great taste of sugar crisp? Can't get enough of that sugar crisp, sugar crisp, sugar crisp. And we're back with more 
of the Pope on film. Hey. Yes. If you're like me, you're no doubt a big fan of this podcast, the Pope on film. I mean, who isn't? It's so popular. It's taking over the nation. When we streamed last week, episode 444, we had 2.3 thousand people watching us. Of course, it only said four on Twitch, but that's just liberal bias. Yes. Uh, that's Twitch shadow banning. That's just Twitch shadow banning. Yeah. Uh, but only the real fans, the true hardcore fans who have been with us since the beginning, would know the two main facts about the both of us. Two undeniably real and in no way made up on the spot facts about the two of us, America's hottest will they or won't they couple, the new Sam and Diane, it's Bunny and May Lynn. First and foremost, Bunny, is the fact that when you are not doing the podcast, you are a celebrated circus clown. So tell us, Bunny, how did you get into the amazing, wonderful, complicated world of clowning? Well, I come from a long line line of clowns. My father was a was a serious, seriously big clown, uh, and I I just happened to have the shoes, you know. Nice. Uh, they were laying around, so I, I would just start wearing the shoes, and then there was the face paint and all of that, and it just it just became a thing and frankly I I whereas I'm world renowned and that's great. I, I wish people would recognize it for the fucking addiction that it is and how it's tearing my life apart. I mean <sighs> I'm sorry. Who pays one thousand dollars in a week for white grease make grease fake face makeup? It's insane. It's insane. Every time I walk past a little car, I have to get in it. Yeah, that's got to be difficult. That's got to be difficult. I would like to give a shout out to Cousin Jaden. He wrote that one. My life is a horror story. Uh, maybe you could Maybe you could get on him. Uh, you should have been on that one clown season of American Horror Story. Yes. That, that was a real missed opportunity. And the second fact which is about me, is that I'm a lover of history. I love it, but I'm also a storyteller. So this is the part of the podcast where I get a story from the history books, maybe one that people don't know too well, and I reword it via my own unique storytelling razzmatazz. And that's what this is, another educationally uneducational installment of historic approximations. We dropped the S. Historic approximations, or as we like to call it, formerly known for years as Steve's historic approximations, as I called it repeatedly, annoyingly, whether anyone wanted me to or not. But a dead name is a dead name, and we are moving on. This week, here on The Hap, we will be discussing the history of the legendary, historic, and vitally important to American society, the legendary hip-hop group that no one remembers, and why you should remember them. And also, how this massively historical hip-hop group is somehow inexplicably tied to Charles Rocket. Yes, Charles Rocket, once touted as Saturday Night Live's Next big thing. Yes. It's like, yes, we know that all of the main cast of Saturday Night Live is left, but we've got an all new cast here for Saturday Night Live 1980, our sixth season, which will no doubt go down in history as our best season. And we've got a I... huge, massive star right here, Eddie Mer Eddie Murphy, can you move out of the way? There you go. Charles Rocket! Yes. And then Charles Rocket would eventually end up being fired for saying the F word live on TV. 
Specifically, the episode was February 21st, 1981. Charlene Tilton was to- was hosting that episode. And then after Charles Rocket was fired, they said, okay, well, we got rid of Charles Rocket. We really pushed him to be the next big thing. But now we've got someone even bigger, a massive star who's going to go on to huge things. This is going to be our next big thing. Eddie, Mur- Eddie Murphy, get out of the way. There you go. Joe Piscopo. Really proud of that. I just came up with that whole bit off the top of my head, and it was hilarious. Yes, it was. So I, I, uh, I don't know about this being the worst season, but it was the most bizarre season. Yeah, I you watched know? an episode. I watched an episode from season six uh, for this half, and uh, it was nigh unwatchable. I had a really hard time. It was nice to see uh, a young Eddie Murphy uh, on his in his prime, and it was nice to see the the centerpiece for this hap. But uh, and uh, Gilbert Gottfried was not unattractive when he was younger. <laughs> I was surprised. To see a young, dashing Gilbert Gottfried with a semi-normal voice, almost looking attractive, it was surprising. Yes. But yes, the, but this the is but is if there was ever a case of being the wish version of the original cast of Saturday Night Live, yes. that was the cast of this season Saturday Night Live. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, he, he's uh, Charles Rocket. To, to try to bring it back in line here, yeah. Charles Rocket was clearly like the... If, if a corporate board was going to make Chevy Chase, it would be Charles Rocket. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Uh, so, you might be wondering, wow, how is... Charles Rocket somehow tied to one of the most influential legends of hip hop that you've never heard of. Well, don't worry, we'll get there. So, um, Bonnie, quick question. Uh, probably should have been right at the beginning of the half, but it is what it is. How well do you know rap music, my friend? Yeah, not much at all. Um, okay, but well, that's, that's uh, like. We could take the word rap out of there and just say music, and it's pretty much the same answer. Good. I'm glad to hear you say that because you kind of need to know your rap music for this, uh, for this, uh, hap. You need to know a bit about the history of rap music and how it was born and everything. So, surprise, surprise, surprise. It's story time! I will be reading this book to you, Bunny. Okay. It is a uh, preschool board book called The Story of Rap. It's by the same people who made the book The Story of Rock, which I read on my kid-friendly YouTube channel. They did The Story of Rock, The Story of Rap. I didn't bother to uh, purchase The Story of Country, but... There you go. The story of rap. Are you ready, Bunny? Yes. Okay. Rap was born way back in 73 in New York City at a house party. And that right there is DJ Cool Herc. He will be important to our uh, hack later on. DJs mixed beats for dancing crowds. Speakers thumped and the bass was loud. There's a DJ Cool Herc, and he is uh, getting records and making beats. I, I thought DJ... maybe he was playing foosball? No. DJ's friends would make up rhymes telling stories line by line. So uh, DJ Cool Herc would get a beat going, and they'd just pass a microphone around, and people would just try and rhyme to the beats. And uh, look at that. It's me, pre-transition. What am I doing in this? I don't know. What am I doing in this book? I'm so confused. 
These rhymers were the very first MCs. No one had ever heard songs like these. Then came the great Grandmaster Flash, who taught us how to mix and scratch. He was the first person to ever do the... 80s rap came to stay, and Run DMC walked this way, and they always wore Adidas. Then straight out of California, we tuned into NWA. And uh, I read this last night to Eleanor to practice, and Eleanor said, what does NWA stand for? And I said, oh, not without almonds. <laughs> they were big fans of almonds, and they were always singing about nuts. This new sound spread so far and wide, no one could stop it, but people tried. And then here's all the angry people that are angry at the rap music. Then Soul met hip hop with a tribe called Quest. Ah! I love their music. Electric relaxation is so good, and they do a they do a collaboration with leaders of the new school. Uh, the song is called Scenario. Ah, I've had that memorized since eighth grade. Tupac faced Biggie as East Coast battled West. 90s rap held a message. They were rebels with a cause. Everyone was listening to Snoop Dogg and Nas. Lauren Hill had a voice that could make you cry, and Missy had the moves that were super fly. Now Kendrick's staying humble, and Kanye's a bastard. Yes. I'm covering him up. He doesn't get to be in this story anymore. Jay-Z has the flow that will never, ever leave us. Rap is for the people, just like from the start. It's more than music. It's a work of heart. And that is the end of that story. Yay! Suddenly a wild story time appears. So I wanted to, to, to do that story time in the middle of the hat because it's important. So, uh, uh, okay. So hip hop music came from the Bronx in the 1970s and it bloomed from there. And when you think of the early days of hip hop music, there are names that fans and even some hip hop noobs would recognize. Names like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, uh, the Sugar Hill Gang, Curtis Blow, Tom Jones, Melanie. Well, I've got a brand new pair of roller skates. You've got a brand new key. I've been obsessed with that song lately. I have no idea why. Oh, yes, I do. It's it. There was a skit about that song in the new season of Kids in the Hall. But I've been yeah. listening to that song over and over again. It just is the perfect soundtrack to my madness. So, okay. But one name that usually gets forgotten in the history of hip hop is Funky 4 Plus 1. And it's kind of criminal that their name isn't up there with the other founding fathers of hip-hop. Um, the subject of this hap is Funky 4 Plus 1. This is how the story goes. So like in the beginning of our story today, the story of rap, here's DJ Cool Herc. They would have these uh, parties, these house parties, and these block parties and these neighborhood parties, and his sister would, uh, you know, oh, here's a record player, and here's some speakers, and we'll play some music, and there you go. So she said, oh, well, uh, my brother has more records, and it's kind of, I'm going to get him to do these parties, and he would play these records. DJ Cool Herc, he would be doing these parties in the Bronx, and it really was the birth of hip-hop. He would get a disco turntable, which is this right here. And he would learn that, okay, uh, instead of playing one song, you know, there's a beat in it, the break, the the drum bit, and the beat was always really, really good. So using the turntable, he would he would isolate the beats and then just let the beat continue over and over again. And then People would pass the mic around and would rhyme over the breaks. And it be, he became so popular with his uh, house parties that people would come just to dance to the breaks. 
that he was creating as a DJ. So the dancers, this is a fun fact, the dancers were known as break girls and break boys, which would eventually be shortened to be girls and be boys. And that's where that came from. The term be boy came from the people who would dance at DJ Cool Herc's parties. And not a lot of people know that. And were they also break dancers? Uh, break dancing came from this. Yes. I, w- I would I would think that that sort of leads into that. Yeah. So uh, so it's the seventies, and DJ Cool Herc's Bronx parties are the place to be. Cut to a young man named Baron Chappelle and his family. They move into the Bronx, and young Baron Chappelle has an older brother, and he's mad popular, and he's and he's going to all of these parties. He starts hanging out with DJ Cool Herc at all of his Bronx house parties, and little Baron Chappelle is all jelly. He's super jealous. He's like, I want to go. I want to go to the house party. Can I go? I want to hear the beats. Please let me go. Can I go too, please? And the cool older kids are like, we don't want this little kid to party with us. You know, because we might do a little drinking, do a little. So we we don't want this kid here. So like, OK, OK. Uh, OK, little, little brother, listen up. You can come with us, but there's a catch. You're cool. Herc's roadie now. You set up his shit. You carry his stuff. Tons of he- heavy stuff. Speakers, his record collection. This is going to be hard work and you'll want to give up. But Baron really wanted to go to these parties, and he didn't give up. He loved this new music, so he would set up everything for Cool Herc and bring his records. And he loved this new music that DJ Cool Herc was pioneering in New York so much that he'd study Cool Herc. And when he wasn't being Herc's roadie, little Baron Chappelle went out and bought the same records that Herc was using. And he got so good that Baron's brother introduced little uh, Baron Chappelle to another inspiring young MC, a guy named Keith Williams. So uh, these two wannabe MCs joined together. Baron Chappelle became DJ Baron, and Keith Williams became DJ Breakout. And they found an MC who rhymed well, a guy hilariously named Kevin Smith. He would go on to be named K.K. Rockwell and not MC Silent Bob, which I think was a mistake. Uh, I'm a little bit upset about that. I do like the K.K. It reminds me of K.K. Slider from uh, Animal Crossing. Um They formed a group, and they called themselves the Disco Brothers. And as time went on, the group would add more and more people, including a female MC named Sharon Green, who would become Shaw Rock, now widely considered the first female rapper ever. So already... Okay, I I need to interrupt, though. But, like, the rappers going by KK... Weren't those, like, didn't you have to be over the Mississippi line to be KK rapper? I don't know. I yeah. don't know. I don't yeah, know where KK Rockwell's Mississippi, from. I'm pretty sure. Other, Maybe other from than, Memphis. Other than that, you would, you would have to be a W rapper. A W rapper. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, already, this band is historic, and we haven't even gone to Charles Rocket yet. So they're now a hip-hop group. They're headed into the 80s. They're one of the first groups in the Bronx to do hip-hop, apart from Grandmaster Flash and his people. They were also the first rap group where everyone had their own separate mics. Back in the early days of hip-hop, there would be one mic, one person would have it, pass it to the next. So before Funky 4 Plus 1, groups like the Sugar Hill Gang, you'd see Wonder Mike and Big Hank and Master G passing one microphone around uh, because Funky 4 Plus 1 was also one of the first rap groups to say, yeah, we're going to rhyme, but also, you know, we're big fans of, like, The Temptations and The Jackson 5. We're also going to dance. They were one of the first groups to put an emphasis on the dancing, which uh, 
And then a lot of other groups would mimic that. And of course, Funky 4 Plus 1 was the first mixed gender rap group ever. Already, it's pretty his they are a pretty historic group. We haven't even gotten to the main gist of the historic approximation yet. And already, it is a crime that people don't know more about the group Funky 4 Plus 1. This is, this is, they are the founding fathers and mothers of hip hop over here. They had a single that came out in 1980 called That's the Joint. It became their signature song. It would later be sampled not once on a Beastie Boys album, not twice on that same Beastie Boys album. It, the song That's the Joint would be sampled three times on the Beastie Boys' second album, 1989's Paul, Paul's Boutique. And this is a separate chat, but when does sampling go from homage to ripoff? Yeah. It, it wouldn't be surprising that, like, oh, here are three uh, white guys from New York stealing a, a, a black group's entire thing. But, hey, that's a different half. Anywho. Okay, and just since we were on the conversation, I couldn't help it, but young MC is 55 years old. I just want yeah. to let you know. Yep. Yeah. Uh, huge fan of young MC. Your best friend, Harry, has a brother, Larry. In five days from now, he's gonna marry. He's hoping he can you can make it there if you can, because in the ceremony, you'll be the best man. First off, who's getting married? Your best friend Harry, or is it Harry's brother Larry? Harry's brother Larry. Secondly, why are you his best man and not whoever the brother is? Yeah, why? There are a lot why of am, questions that Young MC has not answered. And why is the person who is telling me that I am the best man? First off, not Larry. Okay, because I think this should be coming from Larry himself. But first off, it's not coming from Larry. And second, he has to tell me in detail who the fuck Larry is. And so also... why am I the best man? And why are you being told that you're the best man five days before the wedding? Yeah. It sounds like you had a, you had a, a list of 19 names, all of which said no. Yeah. Is what that says to me, but... Uh, remember that one episode where we took like an hour breaking down the lyrics to Young MC's Bust a Move? Yes, I do. That was fascinating. And what a who fascinating is telling episode. me this? Because it's not even not a, okay. Not only is it not coming from Larry, who wants me to be his best man, it's not coming from. It's not even coming from my best friend Harry. Yeah. So it's like I'm at a bus stop and some dude walks up to me. Are you, are you friends with Harry? Yeah. Know his brother Larry? What do you do with this? I'm, yeah. So, um, 1980 single. That's the joint. It's one He's of those 55 songs. Today. He's 55 right now. Nice. Nice. He's an old MC. Yeah. So, uh, Funky 4 Plus 1 song, That's the Joint, it did make a Rolling Stones list of the 500 uh, most uh, greatest rap songs of all time. Um, it got some radio play, and uh, it's one of those songs where you might not know it, but if you heard it, if you heard the hook, it's the joint. You You might recognize it. You might. But... I mean, it's it's no uh, it's no rapper's paradise. So, Funky Four Plus One, Trailblazers, Pioneers—they were also the first rap group to receive a major label record deal. Again, I don't know why people don't know about four, Funky Four Plus One. I mean, <laughs> Run DMC. NWA, A Tribe Called Quest, Wu-Tang Clan, BTS, 
none of them would exist without Funky 4 Plus 1 leading the way. Very serious about that. Okay. And on top of their pioneering, they had another very important first. So let's put a pin on Funky 4 Plus 1 and let's talk about the sixth season of Saturday Night Live! Widely considered by many to be the worst season of Saturday Night Live. The reason for that is they had the original cast of people that slowly but surely started leaving. And then finally, after season five, all of the cast was like, hey, it's time to go our separate ways. And even, um, uh, what's his name? Lorne Michaels said, yes, I'm going to be taking a break too. And NBC said, yes, take a break. Take all the time you need. We'll be here. Okay, is he gone? We're doing the show without him. Get people together. And so that was the sixth season of Saturday Night Live. If it wasn't for uh, Eddie Murphy, um, there's a good chance that SNL would have only lasted six or seven seasons, and that was it. And it was Gilbert and Godfrey, fun- too? Because, like... Gilbert Godfrey, yep, for who, one season. Who else was there? Like, I remember Eddie Murphy, Denny I remember Dillon, Joe Piscopo, and I remember Charles Rocket, and, like, that's it. Charles Rocket. Charles Rocket was doing Reagan at the time. Uh... Gilbert Godfrey was in a surprising amount of things. Denny Dillon, uh, a woman. Uh, don't remember anybody else off the top of my head. But they really pushed Charles Rocket. He got his own uh, um, bit on the show called like the Rocket Report. And he yeah. was a man on the street segment. And uh, the funny thing is that they're like, okay, we've got our group. This is our group. They're going to be huge. They're going to be massive. They're going to be the next big thing. People won't care about Chevy Chase or Bill Murray or Gilda Radner. They're going to be talking about Denny Dillon and Charles Rocket. Shit, we need a black. We need at least one black person. Get me a black really quick. We're about to do the show. Get me a black person. Oh, we saw an 18-year-old named Eddie do stand-up. I don't care. He's on the show. Get him over here. And that was Eddie Murphy. If it wasn't for that, uh, SNL would have died a while ago. So it's the sixth season of SNL. Charles Rocket is there. And uh, Charles Rocket really has nothing to do with this half. I, I just like dunking on Charles Rocket. <laughs> they, they did a, a parody of Who Shot JR from Dallas. Uh, JR, as in the beer, and uh, Charles Rocket got shot. And at the end of the episode, live, they're doing like the goodbyes. And they said, uh, so Charles, you got shot today. Any idea who it was? And without thinking, he said, no, I've never been shot before. I'd like to know who fucking did it. And, uh, oh, big scandal, and eventually they let him go. But then eventually they let everybody go except for Joe Piscopo and Eddie Murphy, who would sort of become the rock of the show for a while. Ah, good. So, season six, episode ten of Saturday Night Live, they get Debbie Harry to host. Because Blondie is huge at the time, right? So Debbie Harry is host and musical guest, which they don't do often. You know, they do it for Paul Simon. They do it for Adele, Lizzo. You know who was really good, who really blew me away? Halsey. Yeah. She was great. She was really funny. I don't know any of her music. But she was great on SNL as a host. Oh, yeah, Miley Cyrus. That's another one. And Debbie Harry. And they say, okay, you're going to be host. You're going to be musical guest. You're going to do two songs. But they say, we haven't done this that often. So if there's another band you want on, anyone at all, let us know. We'll get them on SNL. And she goes, You said anybody, right? Yes, anybody you want, any band, any group, any musical artist, anybody, you let us know. And Debbie Harry's like, 
you did say anybody, right? Like anybody I want, anybody I want. That's what you're saying. Anybody. I want Funky 4 plus 1. And SNL and NBC are like, are you sure? I know we said anybody. But here's the thing. They're a rap group. No rap group has ever played on television, ever. Yeah. Period. It's the sixth season of Saturday Night Live. Rappers on TV aren't a thing. No hip-hop group had ever performed on a, on a network, ever. Period. And they're like, I, I don't, we don't know about this. And Debbie Harry's like, they are the pioneers of rap music in America. You get Funky 4 Plus 1 on SNL or I Walk. And they said, okay, but uh, they're going to be the last thing. <laughs> and they were the last thing. I saw that whole episode. And you see Funky 4 Plus 1. The funny thing is, is that at the time that they performed on Saturday Night Live, they had added an extra member. They were always adding extra members. So at the time that they finally made it on Saturday Night Live, they weren't called Funky 4 Plus 1. They were called Funky 4 Plus 1 more. But uh -huh. they performed they performed their, uh, their single, That's the Joint, on Saturday Night Live and became the first hip-hop rap group to ever perform on television, period. Ever. So again, I have no idea why people don't know Funky 4 Plus 1, but dang, they helped create, they were basically the Alexander Hamilton of hip hop. You know, here's the founding father that nobody talks about. Well, we I remember, I remember that Debbie Harry got heavily into, into, rap and hip-hop to the detriment yeah. of rap and hip-hop to the detriment of rap and hip-hop but good on her for be because of her she was the reason why rap made it onto television for the first time i ever. i just find it amazing that that rap was absolutely the whitest thing Blondie had ever done. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't that something? Funky 4 plus 1. When yes. you think of the birth of hip-hop, you think of all these groups, but you don't think of Funky 4 plus 1. But, man, the, the first ever female rapper, the first rap group to get a major record deal, the first rap group to ever perform on television. And it was right next to Charles Rocket, who would be fired, I, I believe, the next episode. I believe because this this was uh, the Valentine's Day episode, and Eddie which Murphy, also she... means that I most likely saw it. Yeah, yeah, Funky Four Plus One. It's the joy. It, it it's. I saw it right before we did this chef hap this yeah. hap because we dropped the S. Uh, I, I I I kept watching, I kept watching, and I kept watching, and I was like. They're coming back. This is just a fucking joke. Yeah. They're, they're coming back. Like, we're going to yeah, come back with, from a commercial break, and there's going to be Bill Murray, you know? Yeah. And there's going to be Garrett Morris giving the news for the hear, hearing impaired. <laughs> yeah. The Killer Bees. In today's tough stories. <laughs> uh, that's freaking wonderful. They're coming back. But, you know, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I, I'm sure I saw it. Yeah. So, I, I I watched season six, episode 10 for this podcast right before doing the podcast. It's nigh unwatchable. I, I, and, and I bet you're asking yourself, gee, I wonder if Joe Piscopo managed to do his Frank Sinatra impression. It's Joe Piscopo. It starts with a Frank Sinatra impression. Yeah. The whole episode starts with Ronald Reagan talking to Frank Sinatra because Joe Piscopo. Yeah. Uh, the wonderful book, Live I, from New I York. I survived 
although there are deep scars, but I yeah. survived. I'm from Jersey. You from Jersey? Oh, I'm from he Jersey. does that skit. He oh does that skit God. in the episode. It drove me nuts to have to watch one of those skits. But I will say. It, it's, it, cool. it's, it's the only thing worse than Opera Man. Yeah. I will say, I hate Joe Piscopo. Uh, the wonderful book, Life from New York at Saturday Night, a whole, an oral history of Saturday Night Life, has a wonderful quote. Eddie Murphy's success went to Joe Piscopo's head. It's fun yes. to dunk on him, and he's uh, insane. That being said, uh, when I was a kid, I loved the movie Wise Guys. Yeah. Do you remember that? I don't think so. It was uh, Joe Piscopo and Danny DeVito, and they work for a mafia guy, a mafia okay. boss who's played by Captain Lou Albano. And they're, they say, here's a million dollars. Go bet it on this horse. And they go to bet his money on this horse. But they hear a tip and decide to bet it on another horse, which loses. And the horse they were supposed to bet on wins. And suddenly people are trying to kill them because they lost the money. It's actually a, a, a pretty charming, funny little gangster movie with Joe Piscopo, Danny DeVito, and freaking Captain Lou Albano in it. The weirdest cast. But Joe it was a Piscopo really funny movie. Was accidentally in a couple of things. Yeah. I, I, I. I don't think that any of them actually benefited from Joe Piscopo hey. being there. Hey, don't interrupt me, bunny. My <laughs> brother interrupted me once. Once. Yes. Definitely, definitely that. another another great movie that Joe Piscopo was in. Accidentally in. Uh, yeah. Along with Dead Heat. Yep. When Joe was in his bodybuilding phase. Yeah. I I still quote Johnny Dangerously a lot of times when I cuss in front of the kids. Oh, a farging ice holes. You piece of sheep. Yeah. You farging ice hole. Like, I still cuss foreign. But that's it for historic approximations this week. That's it for our HAP. Uh, be sure and join us next time for more educationally uneducational fun with historic approximations. Or, as we call it, and cut on that. But yes. It's intermission time. We're going to take a short intermission. There's going to be some cartoons, some music, some fun. When we come back, it is time for our seventh annual discussion of one of the worst Christmas movies of all time, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. So we will be right back with more of the Pope on film. You should have had ice cream to eat, Bunny. I yeah. could have dressed like Santa and you would have been the ice cream bunny. Uh... Oh, missed opportunity. Next time, you just have to have like a big trough. Stick around, we'll be right back with more. So stick around. Don't move, just sit. Just 
just sit down and wait for the show to be back. I swear to God, if you if we come back for the show and you're not sitting there waiting, I swear to God, I will break you in half. I will break you in half. Don't you test me. Sit there and wait. Go. Much, much later. Hey, Grandpa, tell me about the time you committed treason. Well, our president was a racist and a rapist, and he lost re-election. So we decided to break into the Capitol and try and hang the vice president and kill a bunch of people. And I, I saw somebody take a big shit in, in a hallway. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty great time, and, and that's my story. That's not a very good story, Grandpa. Well, fuck you, you piece of shit! Between work and school, I'm a very busy person. I don't have time to meet that special someone. So I went to loverstate.com, paid the $700 fee, and filled out the questionnaire, which they obviously ignored. Hello? Hey, baby. My name's Ted the Stead. Ted the Stead? Yeah, um, it's really Ted the Stud, but, uh, that don't rhyme. <laughs> I wanted someone who was financially stable. Oh, okay. Are you ready to go? Oh, uh, hey, are you going to pay for this? Because I spent my last five bucks on some lottery tickets and some 40 ounces. Oh, never mind. I got some Chef R.D. in the car. Be right back. I wanted somebody who was sweet. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, amazing what you find when your neighbors don't lock the car door. <laughs> hey, you need a Bible? <laughs> I wanted a person who was family-minded. So, do you have any kids? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure somewhere. Hey, who is that there, that there picture of you? That's my sister. Cute. How about later on you, me, and her get together in the bedroom? <laughs> I wanted someone adventurous. Uh, are you expecting somebody? No. Look, uh, if it's the cops, I'm not here. 
You're wanted by the cops? Yeah, look, it's a little bit of a misunderstanding. <laughs> See, I, I didn't know she was 15. I, I thought she was 12. <laughs> I wanted someone to call me unexpectedly and tell me they needed me. Oh. Hello? Hey, baby. Ted, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I know, baby, but I need you real bad. The cops got me. <laughs> I need bail money like now. It cost me 20 minutes of my time to fill out the questionnaire. $700 to join, one bad date, 20 calls a night for two weeks, and another $200 to file a restraining order. Thanks a lot, loversdate.com. Loversdate.com, we just promised you a date. Wow. This room, this room is perfect. The, the aura in here, man. Oh, just, mmm, so good. This is a great, great room. Yeah, I mean, this room is exactly like the one downstairs. I mean, you, you can do whatever you want. Lady. A shrine right there on the oh, wall. Yes, a shrine with incense. Yes, can you smell <sighs> the incense everywhere? <laughs> Yes. And my Chopra poster. Chopra, oh. wasn't he an extra on Star Trek? And my sign. My sign right there. Oh, yes, my sign. Well, we'll have to move the TV. Yes, throw it out. We oh, don't need yes, get rid of it altogether. TV, man. Well, we don't. You don't need a TV downstairs if you don't want it. No, no. that TV. Yes. That TV? No. That one. Wait, wait, are you talking that about one. moving in here? Well, yeah, man. No, 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 no. You guys can't move in here. Uh, well, why not? It, uh, it's so perfect. Um, 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 I, 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 I sleep in the nude. Well, me too, man. Rebels! Rebels! You can't tell me what to do. You're not my dad. I think I'm gonna procrastinate a little bit more. Oh, oh, oh. Hitting up and strings without my right hand. Using my left hand, singing. I need to quit singing so I can start drinking. Here I go. Dark in the city, night is a while. Steam in the subway, the world is on fire. Woman, you won't make give me a sign. Catch my breathing even closer behind. In touch with the ground, I'm on a hot down after you. I smell like a sound, I'm lost in a crowd, and I'm hungry like I was. Cross the line, a discord and rhyme. I'm on a hunt down after you. My mouth is alive with juices and wine, and I'm hungry like a wolf. <laughs> Stuck in the forest, too close behind To be a funny by the moonlight side do 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 do
Love and your mail on your skin so tight. You feel my heat, I'm just a moment behind. And touch with the ground. I'm on a hunt down after you. I smell like a sign. I'm lost in and found. Then I'm hungry like the world. I straight out of the line, a discord and rhyme. Howl and I whining after you. My mouth is lying, I'm running inside. And I'm hungry like the world. 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 Hungry. Burning the ground, away from the crowd. Cause I'm on a hunt down the diary. I smell like a sound. I'm lost and I'm found. And I'm hungry like the world. I'm out of line. It's discord and rhyme. Cause I'm on a hunt down the diary. My mouth is lined with juices and wine. I'm on a hungry like the world. Burning the ground. Break from the crowd I'm on a hunt down after you I sent it the sound I'm lost and I'm fired And I'm hungry like the wall Crunch the line I discard and rhyme I'm on a hunt down after you My mouth is alive I run inside And I'm hungry like the wall I bust a sweat doing that song. <sighs> that deserves a drink. Don't mind if I do. Judge me by my size, do you? Mm. My penis you have not seen. Huge it is. Mm. Yes. Suck it, you will. Mm.
Here I sit, patiently, stuck in the sand, oh, woe is me, looking and waiting for someone to get my sleigh out, for day is done. Oh, woe is me, oh, woe is me, who will set old man to free, who will give me a helping hand and get my sleigh out of the sand, my reindeers left me sitting here, it was just too hot for them, I fear, my predicament lacks its usual cheer. Because Christmas Day will soon be here. Who will, who will help me? Who will set me free? And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. It's time, Bunny! It is time. Yes, and I'm dispensing with the usual intro because this is, again, yet another special episode where we will be once again for the seventh year in a row watching this movie right here, Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Hey, this movie is uh, copyright free. Couldn't we just, like, play it in the middle of us? That's a, that's a poster that I have never seen before. This one? That is yeah. hideous, yeah. yeah. Looking at it right now, it is. That's a weird-looking one. Uh, so every year we finish the holiday season by discussing Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. And every year I come up with all new notes that you have never seen before. In fact, I didn't even know why I'm mentioning it. It's not like I've used the exact same notes for seven years in a row saying the exact same thing every time we get to the last episode of the year. No one would ever listen to the show enough to go back to former episodes and check. So there's no point in me even saying that. Of course, this is an entirely new episode where we're saying entirely new things about Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. And besides, you, the listener, are too lazy to check. So, well, Poffies, it's the holiday season. Time to hang up your stockings, light your menorah and hide your painted eggs. Time to wear some green or else you'll get pinched. Isn't that so weird that there's like one sexual harassment holiday out there? You know? Where it's like, hello, this is the holiday in America where if a stranger isn't wearing the right color, I get to touch them. That's <laughs> weird. And Isn't it considering that Irish people don't do that? Yeah, and then, like, in the 80s, like, you would literally get pinched by a stranger. No, I'm aware. Yeah, it was, it was, it was weird. Yes. Uh, Blast in the past. This is what came out in suit. Oh, my God, I was just looking up. The kitten. What the, what the heck? Okay, so, uh, the Natasha. Again. Let me look at the kitten. Uh, I don't know. 
His name is Skimble Shanks, the railway cat, and he can tap dance. Watch. Skimble Shanks. I saw a thing. Uh, uh, uh. Jellical cats do jellical no, shit. No. I saw a video where you can tell if you have a good cat by dangling them. That's the term mm. they use, dangling. dangling. You hold them under their front, front legs and let them just dangle and wave them back and forth. And if they can do that, they're going to be a good cat. Nice. My cat, it's so weird. My Honey. cat won't dangle. So uh, Natasha just found her Sears uh, shopping rewards card. Uh, I, I don't mean to brag, but my wife can get discounts at Sears and Kmart. Oh, so, I know. Like, I know whoa! Oh, the wow. weird thing is, is that I you were listening. Right there, yeah, so. you were listening in your in 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 your room while you were cleaning. You were listening to the song "Bitch" by Meredith Brooks. I was. I'm a bitch. I'm a bitch. And every I'm time that song bitch. comes on, I think of Sears. Because there's that one line in the song where she says, see the softer side. And I always think of the commercials. Come see the softer side of Sears. So right before you came in here, all gun ho saying, I found my Sears rewards card. I looked up Sears on Wikipedia. And in 2019, they closed down all of these stores, but they left a certain amount open. And then s most of them closed. They're like, we're going out of business, but the stores that are open, you can stay open. And it's like, yeah, and you'll probably stay open. I mean, unless a, a major act of God shuts everything down. So most of the Sears that were still around, despite the fact that the company went out of business, most of those that were still in business closed down because of the pandemic. But there's one an hour and 40 minutes away in Muskogee, Oklahoma, that's still open. It's not a Sears. It's a Sears hometown. Yeah, it's, it's like a the, small mini Sears. It's got appliances and shit. That's what we yeah. have here. When the big Sears came yeah. down, they kept the little. They, they kept they, the they little they Sears. Into a small Sears. Yeah. Right next to the, the, the wild, wild wing, yeah. wings one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buffalo Wild Wings. That's the place. Right next door to that. Yeah. And they eventually uh, shut down because of the pandemic. Yeah, but isn't but, that uh, isn't that something? There's still one open here in Oklahoma. A relic. And then uh, it's so, so fortuitous again. that I'm here thinking about Sears and you come in having found your Sears rewards card. You are a VIP to me, honey. Smooch, smooch, smooch. You saw that. You all saw that. She is still right here. <laughs> and on our Christmas episode, and on our Christmas episode, here is your Sears rewards card back. I put that right there in between the boobs. Just want to make sure that that is secure. And it is. Okay. Uh, yes, it's the holidays. Time for the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. Yes, it's time for Maxwell and I to one, once again undertake our annual rite of Hodge. Maxwell's favorite part of Hodge is the drinking from the well of Zamzam, but my favorite part is the counterclockwise running around the Kaaba. So I guess I'm just old fashioned like that. Yeah. Yes, my friends. It's, it's about tradition. For, it's about tradition. It's about the Christmas tradition of lighting a bag of your own poop on fire ringing someone's doorbell and running away. Yes, my friends, time to talk about the true meaning of Christmas. Uh, dressing in costumes and getting free candy from strangers. It's about eating insane amounts of turkey and fall as falling asleep in front of a football game. It's about eating candy hearts, and most importantly, it's about the birthday of America and barbecues. Yes, Christmas, the day that we celebrate the birth of Christ by becoming the angriest, greediest MFers on the face of the earth. Christmas also is about classic Christmas movies. You know, there's so many classic, classic Christmas movies that have come out over the years. Kiss Kiss, Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, Gremlins, Die Hard, and this week's film, which saves you time and money by being two. Two! 
Two crappy movies in one! It's the notoriously hideous cinematic stillborn known as Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny! No, no, hold on, hold on. Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny! Yeah! This week's movie, this week's movie is so bad that a lot of people, including some bad movie lovers out there, I've never even heard of this movie, let alone seen it. It's a real under-the-radar type of a movie. Now, the difficult part of this uh, discussion of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, which, again, we have never had before. This is a wholly new bit of notes that no one has ever heard before. Um, <laughs> uh it's difficult to explain this week's movie without sounding completely insane. You know? Okay. okay. But the basic plot focuses on Santa Claus, who it should be noted, rates a 9.5 on the Joe Don Baker sweat meter. <laughs> that is a joke that I have never said before. Yes. Ever. And if I had... It's not like you would go back and it, you, the listener or viewer, would go back and watch all the other times that we've done this. Uh, so uh, why am I even mentioning it? So uh, uh, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. We've discussed this film in the past in episodes 105, 154, 198, 241, 285, and 429. This right here is our seventh uh annual viewing of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. Uh, and of course, I take different notes each time, which yes. uh, I think really keeps things fresh, you know? Because I'm a professional. I wouldn't just pull out the same notes over and over again from a really old episode of the podcast and just do them over and over again. I wouldn't do that. Another thing that I wouldn't do is find just one page of the old notes and then freak out because I'm missing the other page and then spend an entire day listening to our last episode, episode uh, 429, and writing it all down word for word so that I can transcribing an entire episode of the podcast because that's something an insane person would do. Yes. And I am not an insane person, which is why every year when we get to the last episode of the year, I write all new notes for this movie. Even though this is the seventh year that we've done this film, every time is different. Why? Because we are professionals. Yes. I Damn know, it. Bella Lugosi, and you're all very excited, but look, we are professionals. The basic plot... Uh, is about Santa. He crashes his sled on a beach in Florida. That's Florida the state and not Flo Rida the rapper. Yes. I would hate for you to get confused. Allegations that he was drunk have not been confirmed. Yeah. Uh, uh, Flo Rida the rapper. That is a joke. That makes perfect sense right here in the year of our Lord 2022 because it's a new joke that I have never said before. So uh, the reindeer leave him because it's too hot. Personally, I hope he fires the reindeer. I think that that's uh, uh, unprofessional. Yes. Insubordinate. Churlish. So uh, then a uh, kid's come and help him to try and get Santa out of the sand. He's stuck in the sand. A gorilla shows up, a donkey, other animals from a theme park petting zoo. We'll get to that later. A number, a bunch of people try and get Santa out of the sand. He summons kids uh, with his mind powers. Uh, X-Men to me! Like that. Like, uh, do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Uh, the Illuminati. We'll see you now. <laughs> uh, then out of nowhere, a whole different movie breaks out. And uh, it's actually a much longer movie. Yeah, this movie within a movie is actually much longer 
And and all of this Santa nonsense, it is just like the, what would you call it, the bumper? The wraparound. The wraparound. Yes. wraparound. There you go. Um, actually, there's another bit to this, because... In the movie, within a movie, the character of Thumbelina, if you watch the Thumbelina version, there's two versions, we'll get to that later. The character of Thumbelina visits a pirate theme park in Florida post-Disney bastardization. They visit Pirate Land Amusement Park for no reason whatsoever. So really, it's a movie about Santa Claus, and then a, and then <coughs> in a movie within that movie... A girl goes to Pirate World, and while she's in Pirate World, she imagines the movie Thumbelina. So it's kind of a movie within a movie within a movie. It's crapception. Yes. Uh, Inception jokes, very topical here in the year of our Lord 2022. Because I, I just wrote that joke for the first time. Yes. Just a few days ago. So, uh... Not, not when the movie first came out. Not when the movie first came out. Yeah. Of course not. So Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. I keep wanting to call it Santa Claus versus the Ice Cream Bunny, but unfortunately there's no fight. I and think that would have been a up. better movie, though. That would have been a better movie. Santa Claus versus the Ice Cream Bunny. Okay, that's a completely different story. This is a 1972 kids movie. And it's important to note that throughout the 60s and 70s and even the 80s, the powers that be in Hollyweird seem to literally think that, like, okay, we're going to make a movie, and it's going to be good, and we're going to have a good plot, and uh, good... Uh, oh, wait, this is a kid's movie? Okay, remember, people, kids are stupid. Let's crank out some crap. And I say 60s and 70s and even the 80s, because, yes, I have seen Mac and Me. What, you think I've never seen an episode of, of Conan O'Brien before? With, uh, what's his name? Ant-Man? Paul Rudd. Wow, it says a lot that in order to remember Paul Rudd's name, I've got to say Ant-Man first. Wow, yeah. It says a lot. Like, I don't need to go Thor, Chris Hems Hemsworth. I don't need to do that, but I, apparently I need to do that for Ant-Man. That's fascinating. Now, this week, uh, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians to another quickly churned out piece of crap. Uh, but that one at least has a rocking theme song. Yeah. Yes, it you spell does. it S-A-N-T-A-C-L-A-U-S, hooray for Santa Claus. <laughs> now, this movie, this week's movie is shit. But in order to fully get to the bottom of Santa Claus and the ice cream bunny, we need to talk about a specific movie genre. Bunny, you will never guess. In a million years, what movie genre we need to discuss? That's a good soup. Uh, Can you guess? Please? I am going with uh, French New Wave. No. Really I popular in the 70s, man and woman, things like that. No, we will not be talking about French New Wave. Uh. We'll be talking about nudie cuties. Ka-chow! The Pope on film, kicking it up a notch. So, uh, nudie cuties. What are those? Well, let me uh, mail in tell you. Nudie cuties were softcore nude movies from primarily the 50s and 60s that featured ample toplessness, but select bottomless, no bush, no dong, but a lot of cheek. And usually... Some of the broadest humor to ever be written into a script. Humor so broad, it made Benny Hill look like Shakespeare. Yes. Like, imagine Hee Haw, but Minnie Pearl and Roy Clark are fucking naked. And also, <laughs> I'm sorry to put that into your head. I sincerely apologize. Look at that new joke. I mean, they're all new jokes. <laughs> Speaking of Benny Hill, you remember Benny Hinn, Bunny? Yes. The crazy white-suited Middle Eastern minister who would just heal people by touching them? That was the funniest show on uh, and, the Trinity Broadcast Network. And knock people down with his jacket. Yeah. 
that that was some hilarious BS. Man, what happened to him? I loved that. He'd be just healing people. Oh, what happened to him? Is he dead? Probably not. Probably he was a horrible not. person, so he's probably still alive. Meanwhile, Betty White? Yeah. So, I've got a list here. A brand new list that I've never uh, made before. I've got a list of some of the classic nudie cuties that have been created. Now, did I make up some of the titles? Yes, but I didn't make up too many of them, so maybe get off my lady dick. Okay? Damn, y'all. Transphobic. Yeah. Uh, that was new. I mean, this is all new. So here are some titles of some classic nudie cuties. Nudes on the Moon. <laughs> the Ghoul Goes West. Yes. <laughs> Uh, the monster of Camp Sunshine. That's about a monster that attacks a nudist colony. I've seen that one. That one sucks. Nudes at the Abattoir. Okay. Law and Order Naked Homicide Division. Uh, Natasha the other day was like, uh, "Oh, what's the name of that woman that's been in Law and Order for like the past three hundred years? What what's her name?" And it's like, her name is Mariska Hargitay, and Natasha's like. How do you so easily know the name Mariska Hargitay? And it's like, because of the executioner. Yes. From that one movie was Mickey Hargitay. Yes. So I will never forget the name Mariska Hargitay. Ever. The daughter of somebody. She is actually the daughter. Uh, crazy. She was, she... She was the daughter of Queen Elizabeth. Oh. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth and uh, oh. Ernest P. Worrell uh, had a baby. Uh, you know who delivered the baby? Vincent Price. It's crazy. He was just always so uh, helpful. Yeah. Also, uh, the moment that Jeannie uh, asked me that question is when the edibles kicked in. Yay! So, that's fun. Huzzah! Uh, some more nude nudie cuties. Nudie University. Nakedsville, USA. Citizen Kane. Naked Welders. And of course, the classic trilogy, Nudie Popes Go Bananas. One, two, and three. Personally, oh, I thought oh. the third one. You know, you could miss that one, but everyone loves Nudie Popes Go Bananas, too. Okay, never mind. I made up a majority of the list, but you get the general idea yes. about yeah. what a nudie cutie is. A cheap movie shown in a badly lit grindhouse theater in the bad parts of New York City before P.F. Chang's and the M&M store came along and sanitized it all. Yes. And at this point, you may be wondering why we're having this conversation about nudie cuties when we're supposed to be talking about Santa Claus and the ice cream bunny. But don't worry, we'll get there. Okay? Yes. So just yes. calm your, your butt. I changed what I was going to say because suddenly Eleanor is here beeping that freaking dollar store cash register. You, you, you want to play with it? Fine. But don't. Make the beeping and the talking of the cash register, okay? Okay, okay. Also, hey, hey, I love you. Okay? I noticed you didn't say, I love you too. You are grounded until you are 27 years old, Eleanor. Now you have to get in a cop uniform and get in a squad car and announce yep. it. you got to say it back. <laughs> yeah. Gotta That's say it back. One of the leading directors of Nudie Cuties was a guy named Barry Mahon. And I'm sure the H is silent, like Vince McMahon, but uh, I believe that all letters matter. Yeah. So sorry, Barry Mann. You're Barry Mahon now. Sorry, woke leftists. <laughs> That's a joke because we are the leftists. 
We are the leftists, mister. Yes. That was a craft reference. Anywho, Barry Mahon was a veteran. He was in WWII. And according to Wikipedia, he was captured and he tried to escape and he was a hero. And they made a film about a little film about Barry Mahon. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called The Great Freaking Escape. And let that sink in. The film The Great Escape was based on, wait, hold on a minute. Barry Mahon was actually considered to be one of the true life stories that The Great Escape was based on. And I believe he did milk that. But no, that film is now known to not be about him so please re- disregard the last six years of us covering santa yes. claus and the ice cream bunny but that's okay because Oopsie. this is totally new never before said uh so barry mahon was in wwii he came back to the u.s and started cranking out cheap ass low budget schlock He would go on to make over 60 films in his lifetime. He started with nudie cuties because what's the one thing you put in it? You put it in a movie and it becomes a hit. Tits. And Barry Mahon directed such totally real cult films as Forbidden Flesh, Sex Club Intern, Nudes A Go-Go, Swinging Nurses, The Love Cult, Nudes on Tiger Reef, The Beast That Killed Women, Bottoms Up, and my favorite title, the one with the most pizzazz, The Diary of Knockers McCalla. (laughs) And fun fact about the movie, The Diary of Knockers McCalla, the script was written by Nelson Mandela in prison. So... So was that uh, in direct competition, like kind of like a Marvel DC kind of thing with Chesty Morgan? I would imagine, I would imagine so. Yeah, uh, man, that movie. Yes, we covered that, was a that great, movie. Great, that was a great episode of the podcast. But Barry Mahon didn't just focus on nudie cuties. No, the it veteran was. Sense. It would make the uh, click in the flash. <laughs> yeah, she had a she had a camera in her boob, and she would go click, and yeah. she would kill people with her boobs. And then, oh no, there's a bomb in her boobs. Don't you get it? It's a booby trap. Yeah. The veteran was a prolific movie maker, so he didn't just make nudie cuties. He also released such stinkers as Pagan Island, Cuban Rebel Girls, and Rocket Attack USA which was also featured in a hilarious episode of Mystery Science Theater 3000, season two, so it was a Joel episode. And we all know that Joel was the best. Joel and Mike were my Stephen Joe from Blue's Clues. Yes. Sure, Joe was around longer, but everyone knows that Steve's char- star doth shine the brightest. Yes. That is yeah. entirely new, as is this entire take on Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. This is my favorite episode of the year because I love taking fresh new looks at this movie and not for any other meta reason that is too highly specific to be funny to others. Yes. Yay! Well, this is how the story goes. It's the late 60s in Dania, Florida, and they open a 100-acre theme park called Pirate's World. What? A big theme park in Florida? That will never work. But for a few years, Pirate's World was a pretty big freaking deal. It opened on April 8th, 1967, and it was primarily known at the time as the first major Florida theme park. But another thing that they were well known for is that they had a big outdoor auditorium and the lineup of concerts that they had at Pirates World was freaking insane. Yes. Led Zeppelin, The Grateful Dead, Black Sabbath, The Doors, David Bowie, Frank Zappa, Steely Dan, and Johnny Winter recorded a live album there. 
1971's Live Johnny Winter and was recorded at both Fillmore East in New York City and friggin' Pirates World. <laughs> so for a small period in time, a very, very, very small period in time, Pirates World was the place to be. Hey, look at that. A theme park in Florida. Also a cool concert venue. Man, when people think of Florida and theme parks, they are always going to think of Pirates World. Cut to the Disney Corporation. Ten minute warning. And, okay. Uh, the Disney Corporation comes out and says, hey, we've gotten an amazing, wonderful, and altogether wholly original idea. We're opening a massive theme park in Florida. Never before done, we're the first. And by and large, the Disney people got all the credit for being the first theme park in Florida when it opened in 1971. Uh, Pirates World opened in 1967. It would be forced to close in 1973, but they tried the Pirates World people. They fought and struggled, and someone said, how can we get people into the parks? And the idea became... What if we made some cheapo kids movies here in the park and they'll not only turn a profit because we'll make these uh, kids movies for the cheap, but the movies will also act as de facto ads for our theme park. And as the stars aligned around that time, Barry Mahon's nudie cuties weren't making any money anymore. Uh, what other movie genre can I do that I can make on the cheap and will be guaranteed to make money? So yada, yada, yada. Uh, Barry Mahon is now cranking out uh, shitty kids movies. He makes a shitty Wizard of Oz movie for kids, and he needs a place to film it. Pirates World! I have never seen those before. I think they might be Mel. Uh, and a uh, fun uh, side story. Barry Mahon's like, hey, this isn't just a cheapo kids movie. This is a big deal. And we have someone to star in it. Maybe you've heard of her. Judy Garland, but of course he never talked to Judy Garland. It was all bullshit. He was just uh, he was just trying to drum up some publicity. So the guy's a real huckster. Uh, so after the Oz movie, Barry Mahon made Jack and the Beanstalk, a kids movie for Pirates World, and then after that, he made Thumbelina, also at Pirates World, and then. He would record maybe 15 to 20 minutes of extra footage of Santa on a beach and just shove those two pre-existing movies into the new footage and say, hey, a new movie. Thus, Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny were born. And they had two different releases. You either got Thumbelina inside of Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny or you got Jack and the Beanstalk inside of Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Uh, and Bunny, this year we watched the... Jack and the Beanstalk version, uh, because it was shorter. <laughs> I I originally uh, said that we should watch the Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny that is for free on YouTube by Rift Tracks. Uh, they actually did both. Uh, they released a Rift Track version where they make fun of the Thumbelina, and then later they did a Rift Tracks live, and for that one they did the Jack and the Beanstalk version. So they did both, uh, and we were going to discuss it this week, but since Mike Nelson is a right-wing Christian conservative jackass, this podcast of ours is now Rift Track free. If you want something like Rift Tracks, I suggest either The Mads on YouTube, it's uh, the two main mad scientists, Dr. Clayton Forrester and TV's Frank, and they are just themselves making fun of movies. It's a lot like riff tracks, except they're cool liberals and sometimes cops. So yeah. it's already it's already better than riff tracks. Also, they occasionally release some free shorts and free movies. They just released a live recording of them making fun of Glenn or Glenda on their YouTube channel. So you should check out the Mads. Or, if you don't want to do that, go back and watch Cinematic Titanic. Yes. That was fun. It was literally everyone who wasn't Rift Tracks getting together and doing a show. And it had this weird uh, design and plot. It, it and did. I really it was it was a a little off putting how they were on different parts of the boat, kinda. Yeah, yeah. It was odd. 
it was odd, but I really liked it. That was great. Also, uh, check Pluto TV on demand. Uh, there's some cinematic Titanic on there too, if I'm not mistaken. Anywho, what do you think about this movie, Bunny? What do you think about Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny? I, I, I think it's horrible on a lot of levels, but you know, it's Christmas time and I really kind of want to focus on something else. The, I mean, I, I, I really can't call him a genius, but the snake oil salesman in this movie really deserves some kudos. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah, he exemplifies the idea no small parts, only small yes. actors. He I feel the gave exact everything the ex he could. I feel the exact same way about the evil witch in Troll Two. Yeah, where it's like, oh, you you have a small part in a horrible movie, but god damn it, you're gonna try your hardest to make this shit work. Yes, yes. So yeah. so. If you have to watch this movie, just kind of try to concentrate on him. The overall movie looks like uh, a school play production. Yeah. Uh, but a very special kind of school play production where they would probably get a local celebrity of some sort. You yeah. know, like... Crazy Bob from Crazy Bob's used car. Or a uh, News 5 meteorologist, Frank yeah. Camacho. Yes. Or something like that, yeah. Yes, and then he would be all over the posters and everything like that. So yeah. a school play kind of in that sense. Um, One thing I will say, now that I think about it, okay, so they did The Wizard of Oz there, they did... Jack and the Beanstalk, they did Thumbelina, and they did Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. I believe, I might be mistaken, but I think that there might be more films, movies filmed in Pirate's World than there have been in Disneyland. I think only two or three movies have been filmed inside of Disneyland, and one of those was That Thing You Do. I think we only got about two minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Anyway, that is it for our seventh annual entirely original uh, discussion of Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. This is our last episode of the year. And Bunny, I just want to say I love doing this podcast with you and I love you. And thank you and Jeannie for all that you've done for me this year. I've been through the ringer. Yeah. And it's been fun. And I love you guys. And I love thank this you. podcast. Love and you I, too. It, it's always nice to end it with do you think we made the right choice because we were going to pick uh, it was it was either always do Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny every year or always do the Star Wars Holiday Special I think we picked the right one I think we picked the right imagine, one I can't imagine having to watch uh, Life Day every year no yeah but anyway, this is our last episode of the year. Our next episode will be January 8th. We will be discussing the wonderful A24 film, uh, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On, starring Waze, Whale, Whale, Jet, Jensky, Whale, Whale, Whale Jetski. Could that be his name? Whale Jetski? Wonderful film. But uh, that's our next episode. Now that I'm looking back, at I don't this know. Episode, Whale Jet Ski is a pretty cool fucking name. It uh, is. Yeah. That should be you the think name about of that. it. Whale Jet Ski. Uh, now that I'm looking back at this episode, the highs, the lows, the ups, and the downs. Uh, Dead puppies. Vince McMahon. DJ Cool Herc. Funky Four Plus One. Santa Claus. Bunnies with ice cream. I got uh, Barry Mahon. Nudie cuties. I got to say, I think this has been a pretty good episode of the podcast. Yeah. This has been a damn good episode. Okay, I was worried. I was worried there. Yeah, but because uh, I, I felt that it was a damn good episode, but I didn't want to say that, didn't want to step on your toes. But yes, I concur with your assessment. Good, sir. So until next week, I am... Oh. 
I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend Malin. And on behalf of Natasha and Mal and Max and Eleanor and uh, this cat, Whale Jetski, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. You douche waffles and poopy tits. And you ice cream bunnies and your kids. Do 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 Meow, 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 meow,